Great. Excellent. All right. So we're going to um, go ahead and I think officially start. It's 3.01 on my clock or one past the hour, depending on what hour it is, where you in your part of the world. Um, and we have just very, very informally started with all sorts of chatter uh, in the chat box I've asked for success stories, big and small contributions that you've solicited online and virtually um, this month. And I absolutely love, love hearing the success stories. And I have to say, I was just, I just got off doing a webinar an hour ago. And, you know, there are still so many organizations that aren't fundraising and that have board members that think we shouldn't, they shouldn't be fundraising at this time. And honestly, I'm not gonna be talking about that anymore. I feel like for eight weeks now, I've talked about the importance of why it is so critical to continue to raise funds right now. Um, I'm gonna assume that everybody that keeps calling in is ready to ask, convinced that it, you know, that it's appropriate, necessary, donors are giving. Um, just look in the chat box and you will see dozens or hundreds of examples of people having success raising money right now. So, um, okay, so Elizabeth says we had a $25,000 challenge and we now have exceeded $110,000. Um, yeah, so Gary, thank you. You have to move forward. There's no option. All right, excellent. Um, and Karen did a phone call and check in with her major donors to introduce herself and see how they were faring and got um, great conversations and a $2,000 unsolicited donation. All right, excellent. So uh, great, wonderful to see everybody. So listen, the past couple of weeks, I guess the past three weeks I've had guests um, on these Thursday calls, but I decided that I would just have it be me and you today. Um, I didn't invite a guest this week. If you have suggestions of people that you'd love to see me have on and, and banter with or interview, um, I'm happy for those suggestions. So feel free to send them to me in an email. Um, but today it is just me and you. So if you brought a question that you were really hoping I'd answer, go ahead into the Q&A box and um, let me know in the question and answer box what uh, your question is, and I will do my best to get to it. Otherwise, I think the two topics that I really want to talk about today probably are virtual solicitations, how your phone calls and and your your virtual solicitations, your Zoom meetings with donors are going, um, and and, and I think we will at some point sort of take a break and talk about things that you're causing, uh, doing to cause joy. Um, I was mentioning for those who logged on early that this week's blog post, I wrote um, nine sort of out of the box, off the wall ideas for causing joy among your donors and your staff members. And so in a little bit, we'll talk about that, but Oh yeah, just um, Cheryl's reminding us that everybody, please use your drop-down box. Um, when you're typing in, in the chat box, make sure that you're not just sending your message to me. Send it to all panelists and attendees. You do have to click that blue bar and, and click because yes, lots of people are just sending me messages um, just because it's defaulted to just to send it to panelists. Um, so if you want everybody to see what you're saying, go ahead and send it to everybody. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with, um, with talking about virtual solicitation. Because honestly, I think that, so let me set the stage and then I'm actually going to um, open it up today. I may um, unmute a few people if you do want to share a story of a virtual solicitation, um, either talk about you know, what you're concerned about, um, what you've tried, uh, what succeeded, what didn't work, um, what is causing you to stay up at night. Um, so if you want, um, use the hand raising function and I'm gonna go try and um, call on people and unmute a few people in just a minute. But let me sort of set the stage. 
Um, for the past 10 plus years, I have been adamant that the best and really the only way to raise a major gift has been face to face in person sitting across a coffee table or across a desk or in the same room as somebody i mean i went so far as to say that if you were asking for ten thousand dollars or more you should be getting on a plane to go visit your donors and i have to tell you that this global pause that we're all a part of has thrown that completely on its head. And I don't think I'm ever going back to, you know, all, always, always solicit in person. I mean, some solicitations we will, when it's safe, go back to doing in person. But the reality is that I have seen so many people have so much success soliciting virtually. And I'm not just talking about small gifts. I'm talking about five, six, and seven figure gifts. I've had multiple people tell me that they've solicited million and multi-million dollar gifts and, and so many hundred thousand dollar gifts and in that range successfully over the phone and virtually. Now, were these new relationships? No, these were existing relationships with people that they had been working with for years, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think only a very small handful were new-ish donors, but the reality is that, um, that once you've worked to establish these relationships, then, um, then the sky's the limit about what you can really do with people and people do care about your organization are rising to the occasion to help. Um, you know, most people are good and want to help. And so if they're familiar with their work, if they want to continue to see you succeed and your programs and services to operate, and it's not just for uh, frontline workers, it's not just for food organizations, these are all types of organizations getting these huge, huge gifts. Um, so you know, there, there's something to be said for the efficiency and effectiveness of being able to hop on a, a call like this and getting a gift and not having to get in a car or on a plane and look for parking and stay overnight or, you know, it, it's not a two hour or 10 hour endeavor. Someone was just telling me the other day, you know, they cover a, a state, that's their territory. And so they're driving many days, four, five, six, seven, eight hours to go see donors. Um, that's eliminated all this. And so they're able to talk to three, five, 10 times as many donors a week uh, than they were when they were going out to meeting them in person. So just something really interesting to think about. Um, all of a sudden, magically, every person is more experienced with Zoom, um, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's for their organization or for work or for, I mean, my 70 plus year old parents are getting on um, for, for, they take classes at their synagogue and those all of a sudden are Zoom. So now they know how to use Zoom. So it wasn't because for a donor had to teach them or even their kids or grandkids. It was because they wanted to keep taking the class they were taking. Um, and that's true of donors all over the place. So I think, you know, whether or not you're comfortable, um, it's time to really think about how you're going to continue to solicit low and high and mid-level donors, donors of all, all stripes, virtually over the phone and over video chat. And really, really think about you know, I know most people at this point are doing and probably relatively comfortable with check-in calls, with, with thank you calls. And the question is, how are you transitioning to ask for a gift? Um, I also wanna throw out the question, what do you do when a donor, or what do you say when a donor says, how can I help, right? Do you have a good answer to that question? Everybody write that down. A donor says, how can I help or what do you need? It's the same question. How do you, how can I help or what do you need? How do you articulate that? Um, I hope that you're not asking for things that you think the donor wants to hear, 
but that you don't really need, which I see too often. Um, one time I was working for an organization and the, the executive director is out presenting to a group, I don't know, a Rotary Club or some community club. And at the end, she said, you know, what we really need is gifts of um, canned food and diapers. Well, is that really what she needed? No, no. That's what she thinks people want to give. And some people do want to give that. But if you say, listen, you know, it's true that our, some of our clients do need diapers, but when people donate them, first of all, we can get them when we buy them in bulk at a fraction of the price at what you're paying for them at the store. Not to mention the fact that if you get us a certain size and we don't have a kid of that certain size at that particular moment, we have to store them. So what really helps us is financial contributions because then we can use them where the need is greatest. So whether that's for staff or mortgage or diapers, um, but we're gonna buy diapers and canned goods and food in bulk in amounts and quantities and sizes that we actually really need. So the number one way you can help us right now is with a, a gift, a financial contribution. Um, and we can talk about monthly, you know, could you please consider a monthly gift of $25 a month so that you're helping us in an ongoing way throughout the year so that we can be financially secure and run our programs and services for months, weeks and months and years to come. So anyways, all right, good. Lots of great chatter in the, um, in the chat box as always, good. Um, Jan, thank you for suggesting a way to transition to the ask. We've always appreciated your support. Today, our needs are, um, how would you like to help, right? So one of the things that I like to talk about is asking permission to ask. So, you know, let's say you have a call, a video chat or a, an impromptu phone call with a donor, and it's going to go a little differently depending on whether you know the person, whether you don't know the person. Um, but first and foremost, in this day and age, no doubt you're going to start with, how are you? How's your family? Are you working? Are you working from home? Has that, how's that transition been, et cetera, right? A check-in. Then you can do some exploratory questions. You know, we've never talked or we haven't talked in a while. Um, you've been a longtime donor. Tell me about that. You know, why do you care so much about our organization? I've never asked you. So asking some, some questions, some open-ended questions about their giving, why they give, why they care, why your mission is important to you. You might want to ask what other causes they support, right? Just find out a little bit more about them and what they care about. And then say, listen, um, would you be interested in hearing about what's going on at our organization these days, right? Or can, I mean, first you can say, um, let me back that up a bit. Um, can I tell you a little bit about what's going on at our organization and how we're reacting to the crisis, right? We're open, we're closed, we're still ser serving uh, our clients or we've shifted, you know, whatever, just for a few minutes. And then, and then, transition to the ask, ask permission to ask. So this is when it's time to say something like, would it be okay if I shared with you some of the most urgent needs that our organization is facing today, right? We're really looking for help, making sure that we can retain our staff, continue programs and services. And because of that, I'm asking you today to consider a gift, a monthly gift of $25 a month so that we can continue our programs and services for months and years to come. Is that something you'd consider, right? And then stop talking. Um, so anyways, all right, good. Let's, let me go to some questions, but um, I love seeing so much back and forth um, in, the, in the chat box. Okay, so uh, I can't tell if it's my, uh, Michelle, I think it's Michelle. With the monthly donors, we have had almost no loss of donations, but I'm having trouble being able to talk to major donors. They don't want to talk to me. They say we will talk in the future. They are not saying no. Okay, so listen, um, you know, with some people, you are going to be just reaching out and checking in and thanking them. 
other people you are going to be asking. And you have to sort of um, figure that out on a case by case basis, I think. And so I'm surprised actually to hear that your biggest donors don't want to talk to you right now um, because they're the ones who care most about your organization and they're, they're the ones who are supporting you. So um, it depends on either if you're catching them at a bad time or if you're emailing to set up that call, um, you can say, listen, um, are you interested in learning about what our ongoing needs are or what our crisis needs are right now? And if they say, listen, we can't help right now where we, our attention is elsewhere, okay, fine. Then you're just gonna be thanking them and checking in on them. So I think you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but I'm glad to hear your monthly donors have, um, have continued to support. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, an anonymous, uh, somebody who didn't fill in their name says, I'm looking for suggestions on how to get board members to get their, their tushies in gear. That's not the word they used. Um, that's my word. Uh, for peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. I'm the chair and I've reached out, but you know, I have to say, um, You know, I think you need to meet your board members where they are. If they haven't been really good about fundraising in the past, you know, most of them are not going to magically become good fundraisers now. So um, if you didn't have a robust fundraising board in the past, and most organizations don't, um, it's a work in progress, then, you know, to me, it's about giving them tasks that they can be successful at. So, you know, ask, first of all, not asking them as a group, but asking them individually. So if you're the board chair, getting on the phone and calling them one by one, first of all, finding out how they are. Have they been able to transition to working from home? Are they okay? Do they have any sick family members? Um, also making sure that they understand that they that they understand and know what the current needs and situation is at your organization at their organization if they're board members so first and foremost you know it's not about a group ask or just sending out mass emails to your board members it's really checking in with them one on one as well and finding out what could they do right now you know how are they getting involved how are they helping their community um, would they be most effective sharing things on social media? Would they be willing to make thank you calls? I mean, that's a great use for board members right now is to give them um, three or five thank you calls to make every week. Find out. Some will make more than others. Uh, that's not a good job for everybody. Not everybody wants to be on the phone. Um, you can ask somebody specifically, say, listen, if I send you an email, can you forward it to five friends and put your own personal line at the top? Um, so anyways, I would take it board member by board member, but just, you know, have realistic expectations and be patient with everybody. Everybody's struggling now in their own way, and you don't know what's going on behind the scenes in their life. Um, all right, excellent. Let's see, Brianna, how do you justify to your donors how their gift is still needed when you just received a large sum of money from the government from CARES Act? So... Listen, that's, that's an interesting and good question. I'm curious in the chat box if anybody wants to say how they're communicating with donors that, um, that they've received money from the CARES Act. First of all, that is probably a drop in the bucket for what you actually need and what it costs to continue to run your organization. So to me, that is... I mean, it's just um, a small, small piece probably covering the loss that you've sustained. Um, I did get a question the other day in my email about, you know, how does an organization with reserves or an endowment justify asking for money? And I have to say that a couple of things. One is, um, you know, they, the, the implication was that they, this, this person was saying, if I have any reserves, how can I ask people for money without using the reserves first? But they were also sort of teetering on the edge of, of bankruptcy and of closing. And so I was so, I'm, I, 
I, my heart really goes out to them, but you know, I want to look at Harvard as an example. It's just a big bulky example. They have a, you know, a multi-billion dollar endowment and I don't think their fundraisers are losing one minute of sleep worrying about not at continuing to ask their donors for money to ensure that Harvard stays the number one research university in the world. And, and by saying that that costs a lot of money and it's fiscally responsible to have a huge safety net as they do. Um, by you or this, not you particularly, but this organization, this person that emailed me who said, I feel like we can't ask for money while we have anything in the bank. I wanna wait till, till we're totally broke and ready to close the door, makes no sense to me. Your donors want you to be fiscally responsible and have a cushion during times like this and not be at risk of closing the doors. They wanna see your programs and services continue. So, you know, having PPP, um, okay, so I'm seeing in the chat, PPP is a loan, hopefully it's a grant, but you know, you don't know, you may have to pay it back. They're changing the rules every day, it seems. So you may need to pay PPP back. It's just a temporary stopgap. Um, but my guess is that it's only a teeny tiny fraction of the money you actually need. So, all right. Uh, Drew says, I would love to hear how you would respond to a donor who tells you how much money they've lost in the stock market and that they can't give now. Okay, a couple of things. Um, and, and anybody who wants to respond to that as well, if you've talked to um, donors who, who are worried about the stock market, first of all, acknowledge and validate their, their fears. For them, those concerns are real. And I think that, you know, good fundraising, you're not talking anybody into or out of anything. You're, you're providing opportunities for them to invest in the community and make and feel great about those gifts. If you have to convince or conjole or guilt anybody into making a gift, um, you're not doing good fundraising. So, so I think that if somebody's concerned about their financial situation, then you are respectful of that. You say, well, listen, you've been such an amazing donor for us in the past. I, you know, we, we, look forward to you being a supporter again in the future when you're back on your feed. And is there anything we can do for you, right? So not that they, you know, I think by offering that, it's just a nice thing for donors to hear. They don't actually expect you to do anything for them except for to perhaps be a good listener. So there's that. Um, I also want to remind you and remind donors, I mean, that particular donor is, is thinking about giving with stock or, or their whole portfolio, so they're worried about that. But most of your donors, I would say 99% of your donors are making annual gifts and emergency gifts out of their cash flow, not out of their stock portfolio. So it's true, they may not want to make a gift if the stock market's ping-ponging up and down all over the place. And, you know, you don't want them to give a gift out of reduced assets either because that's not good for them. And you want your donors to feel great about those gifts. So I'm all over the place, but I think the reality is that most donors are making annual fund gifts out of cash flow. Now, if they continue to have their job and receive a steady paycheck, most people actually have more money in their banks today than they did two months ago. I want you to think about this. They're not going to restaurants. They're not going to bars. They're not going to theaters. They're not spending money on commuting. Um, you know, I haven't filled up my car gas tank in six weeks. I used to fill it up weekly. You know, there's no train or bus um, fees. Nobody's spending money on commuting. And so, you know, I, so in terms of, um, I, I think most people actually, if they've kept their jobs and they're still working and receiving a steady paycheck, those people actually may have more in the bank. Many of them do. Um, and they're making many of these gifts with their cash flow, with their checking account, not with assets. So I think for the vast majority of donors, 
um, although they may be concerned about what's going on in their retirement portfolio, um, it's not a major issue for making a gift right now. Um, all right, I'm trying to keep track of what's going on in the um, chat box, but I absolutely just can't speak and talk and read uh, at the same time. So I'm going to have to assume that it's all good stuff over here. All right. Okay. Um, let me go to the next question in the Q&A box here. So uh, Risa is asking, can we ask for money now for a virtual gala as well as a gift we would ask for in July of fiscal year 21? So this coming July, I'm guessing. Um, so you can ask for anything that you have a strong case for support for. So what do you need the money for? Do you need the money for emergency programs and services to keep staff on board, to make sure that you are funded well enough to continue programs as soon as you're able to open the doors? Do you need money to run remote programs or you know whatever the case for support is? So to me, um, you can you can ask for anything, but as long as you have a strong case. Now, that being said, I do like to go to donors a couple, once or twice or three times a year. Um, but if I know that there's a few things coming up, I do want to bunch those asks. So if I know that I have a gala and I want my annual fund gift and then there's a raffle, I may go to that donor and say, listen, last year you contributed to these eight things at our organization for a grand total of $1,500. We're hoping this year that you would consider a gift of $2,000, which would cover all those things, your tickets to the gala and raffle tickets and annual fund and an increase for our um, increased needs this year. So you may be able to you know, do that. And instead of going them this to this month and next month and the month after, um, go to them once with their total giving. All right, Kaylee here. So let's see, if someone tells you their business is bad right now, do you still turn the conversation to an ask? How can you still share the opportunity by being sensitive to their situation? All right, what do you think, guys? Let's see. Um, I think in the chat box, we're talking about corporate and business. Um, so listen, I think we do need to be extraordinarily sensitive to what people are going through right now. Um, and if people don't feel they have the ability to make a gift, there's nothing you can say to change their mind except for to make them feel bad. So you don't want to do that, obviously. What you want to do is say, listen, I am so sorry that you're going through a rough patch right now. Um, I hope and I'm confident that things will rebound and I hope that you will uh, remember us when you are able, when things turn around for you. In the meantime, is there anything I can do to, to you know, bring a little joy to your life or, or help in any way? You know, can I, can I make a connection? Can I call and listen? Can I send you, a, you know, a, I don't know, whatever, whatever you could do. Um, and so I don't think that it is appropriate say listen you know um i i understand lots of people are going through hard times right now it's a really challenging time and um we've so appreciated your support in the past and we really hope that when things get better for you you will continue to give i think i'd leave it at that anybody else yeah jam listen to them share the challenges you're facing too see what their reaction is yep okay um excellent yeah all right, so Gary, good. Um, I had this experience with a corporate donor a few weeks ago and I asked if there was anything we could do, um, but we would be in touch and keep them posted on how we were moving forward. So I think that's right, that's absolutely right. All right, good. So Lorraine, I'm newly formed nonprofit. I really have not completed listing my board members. I need some sort of funding as a jumpstart or organization helps cancer patients with extra expenses not covered by insurance. Um, so I have to say, I, I don't want to spend more than a minute on a new organization. Um, 
fundraising is hard. Um, I have to admit, I, I often discourage people coming to me from starting new organizations and encourage them to look for other organizations in their or area doing similar things. Um, you may not find someone doing it exactly the way you'd like to do it or the way you would do it, but um, it's so hard to run a nonprofit organization. Overhead is so expensive and there's so many wonderful organizations out there doing all sorts of things that if you can partner up with an existing organization, um, you're gonna have a much easier time. That being said, you've started your organization. Now it's up to you to go out to your friends and family and your community and look for board members and ask them to start with some seed funding. Okay, so uh, Kelly, CARAC's response, uh, while this grant is helping in the short term, we are in, in uh, anticipating exponential need from our families and need to reach out for your support. Yes, excellent. Oh, you're, you're, help, you're responding to what to say to the CARE Act person, right? The grant is helping in the short term, um, but we're anticipating exponential need from our families and need to reach out for your support. Good, love you, Kelly, thanks. Um, excellent, so Emily says, if we were looking to develop a 90, a 90 development plan, what would you prioritize? Oh, probably 90 day, I think that's what you meant. Um, a few details, we have had to lay off staff and are looking down the road with the likelihood that we'll have to lay off more staff in the coming months. Listen, um, times are really, really hard for organizations and there's, there's no easy way to about it. I would, I would implore your organizations, beg your development, uh, your your CEOs, your board members, to fire development staff last. Um, that's cutting off a revenue stream. It's not an expense. You guys are are not an expense. You are a revenue stream. And you know if you're not generating revenue for your organization, that is another story. And you know maybe. Um, you know, you shouldn't be there in the first place, but it's not because of this. And so if you were raising money before, you can and should be and should be a revenue stream now. And so to me, honestly, for organizations that are cutting staff, I know it's super painful and, and I've not too often seen boards that make this decision, but I would encourage them temporarily to cut program staff before they cut fundraising staff. And that's because if you don't have the money to operate, you won't be able to operate those programs for much longer anyways. Better to, to raise the money, even if your programs and services are on hold for six or eight months or 12 months and generate the revenue so that you can start operating them again. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. Uh, in, in, I'm going to answer one or two more questions, and then we're going to think about things that we can do to cause joy among staff members and donors. So we're going to take a break um, in, in five minutes after two more questions, and we're going to talk about joy. Um, Elizabeth, uh, thoughts about continuing an early phase poverty reduction capital campaign for new transitional housing? Um, Let's see, it's been in the works for several years, but has much community support, just had the groundbreaking, but doesn't have an existing donor base. EZ is pushing hard to stay on track. So um, your question has so many parts to it, Elizabeth. So you all probably know that my other, on my, in my other hat, I am the CEO and co-founder of something called the Capital Campaign Toolkit. If you haven't heard me talk about it, you probably haven't been on very many of these calls. But um, so, and if you're in a campaign or thinking about a capital campaign, um, go over to the capitalcampaigntoolkit.com and check it out. But what I would say that we're doing is encouraging organizations to, for the most part, continue with their capital campaigns. Um, whatever needs they had before this crisis, they still have, those have not changed. And the donors um, that supported them and we're gonna support them, most of them will continue to do so. Now, they may have to do one of two things or both. 
One is with a capital campaign, you can always change the timeline or play with the timeline. So you can either extend the timeline of the period where you're soliciting gifts and or if you had a three year pledge period, um, but now donors need to wait for the stock market to come back, you can have offer a five year pledge period. So you can say to donors, we hope you'll make the same level of gift even if you need longer to pay it off. So, you know, there's some wiggle room with the timing of a campaign. There's also often wiggle room with the dollar goal, the amount raised. And so if you think you're not going to make it to goal, um, thinking about, you know, what phase, you know, if you can phase the project, if you can shrink the project at all, you know, now's actually a great time to be borrowing money. So maybe you'll take out a loan, a bridge loan, or just a loan um, for the amounts that you don't raise. So um, we're really working hard with our clients to figure out how to continue uh, the capital campaign without, um, without stopping it. Now, that being said, Elizabeth, you're telling me you don't have an existing donor base. Um, I don't know if you did a feasibility study or how much you're trying to raise or who you think you're gonna raise the money from. That's a whole nother story and I'm not gonna get into it here. Um, I, I don't know how a capital campaign would work without an existing donor base or some um, <laughs> leads uh, in the community, but um, I hope and assume that you um, sort of, <laughs> have that figured out and wrapped up and maybe that hasn't changed. If you didn't do a feasibility study, um, maybe you need to go back and think through that a little bit. All right, so let's see. I'm gonna scroll through the chat for one minute and see if there's anything that I need to pay attention to. All right, um, okay, good. Susan, let's go to Bring Joy because I want to talk about joy for a few minutes. So on the Bring Joy question, Susan says, our question of the day at our last staff meeting was, what song picks you up every time you hear it? Ah, what a great question. And then we had the song queued up on our phones, so we had a fun start to the meeting. Love it. All right, great. Anybody else? Let's take a um, let's take a seventh inning stretch from questions right now. We're going to take a five minute break. Joy, what are you doing to bring joy to your board members, to your staff members, to your donors? And if if anybody missed um, my blog post this week, it is uh, nine sort of out of the box, off the wall ideas to bring virtual joy to your board members. And I saw somebody um, wanted to know what the name of my other business was. So I'm gonna put it in here in the chat. Capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, campaign, toolkit.com. Okay, there it is, um, capital campaign toolkit.com. Okay, so let's see. Oh, joy, I want examples of joy. Good, good, good. Um, let's see. Oh. <laughs> Staff meetings. Amy says, staff meetings. We're starting or ending each meeting with a joke or a riddle. Sometimes bad jokes, but always gets a smile. Okay. Um, let's see. John says, they gave me a gift basket for my efforts. Totally out of the blue. Awesome. Um, Katie says, we have a, a llama at a local rescue joining our Zoom staff meeting tomorrow. It's a surprise for most staff, two staff, including me gave a donation to the rescue as payment. That is hilarious. You're gonna have a llama on your Zoom call. I love that. Um, we're offering, Doug says, we're offering mindfulness and meditation sessions to staff and donors three times a week. Beautiful. Um, I love these. Oh my gosh, there are so many. I can't read them all. Uh, let's see. Um, Cindy says, our team has a theme to our virtual happy hour every Friday afternoon, virtual backdrops. <laughs> Good photos of ourselves, our children dressing in our school sweatshirts, sports, sports teams, so much fun. All right, um, great, yes, uh, let's see. Uh, Risa says, we had an online program that answered the question, how is Orkodesh uh, easing the burden of the pandemic? We had a fabulous testimonials and our cantor sang songs to the group, excellent. Okay, good. So listen, um, I, well, there's, they're pouring in. I can't possibly read them all. So let me, let me share a few from my blog post and just some of my favorite ideas. So one that showed up in the, in the chat here, 
was um, that uh, that you go to a local coffee shop or get some tea and a, a nice mug and you make a gift basket and drop it at your do donor's door and then arrange to have a Zoom meeting over coffee or tea, but you've provided a mug and tea or coffee and maybe some biscotti as a gift basket. So that's, you know, that's nice. People always like to get things left on their doorstep. Um, to, Two more fun ones that I really want to emphasize. One is, you know, my daughter just had a birthday party. Her, the mother of the birthday girl, had the local bakery drop off a, a cupcake decorating kit. I mean, can you imagine sitting with your whole office and you have um, a box of a dozen, there were mini cupcakes, they were teeny tiny, and bags of icing and sprinkles and fondant and all sorts of things. And I just think that that would be such a fun staff meeting if you're all local you could actually do something like that. Um, I like the idea of bingo, playing bingo virtually, if you get a, a group together, just a way to sort of reconnect, stop work for a few minutes, have some joy, um, do something really fun. Um, you could, you know, share your pets. Uh, I was holding up my dog, which is upstairs, my, my virtual dog right here. Um, but, you know, you could have a dog parade, all sorts of fun things. So, all right, let's see. Um, so depending on if, you're, if your staff and donors are local or if they're all around the country, um, I did one of the local people, I don't know if any of my staff members are on the call. I'm gonna assume not, nobody told me they were coming today. So I have ordered them quarantine care packages. And um, I, or a local person here near me is making cups um, that say quarantine caffeine with the Starbucks logo in the middle. It says quarantine cafe and then the uh, caffeine and then the person's name on the back. And I ordered them masks, um, homemade you know, face masks that are of superheroes or it says like, whatever, superheroes, I think I might put a little snack in too. So that hopefully will get in the mail and be delivered to my staff in the next week or so. All right, so that was a good, um, a good diversion. So I like all these tips and suggestions, um, awesome. All right, let me go back to questions. All right, so what, Holly says, what is the best way to mention the 300 stimulus deduction for donors who don't itemize taxes, some sources say people can only, you know, I have to say, I don't, um, so Holly's question is about sharing tax information and stimulus payments and things like that. To me, it's really, uh, we don't wanna be giving tax or financial advice. Um, you know, you can say, um, I understand that there are more benefits now because of the stimulus package to donating. Check with your accountant or financial advisor about what they might mean for your taxes. You don't want to be giving financial or tax advice. Um, and honestly, that's not the primary reason that donors donate. Um, it's not because of tax benefits. That might be reason number five or six or seven on their list. So if they want to donate, um, that's going to that's gonna supersede any sort of tax implications most of the time, especially at those low levels, like three, six hundred, you know, three hundred dollars, six hundred dollars. Um, okay. Uh, April says, my organization had a fundraiser planned which included raffle items. What are some ways to do a virtual raffle fundraiser? We still have the items ready to go. Oh, good. So I've seen lots of people doing them virtually. Um, you can have a virtual auction for sure. There's tons of companies that do that. And I'm going to leave that to the, um, the town hall for anybody to give examples of what they've done in terms of virtual aux auctions. Um, all right. The question is about ideas, how an organization can know if it's time to merge or close. What are the red flags? Yeah. Um, what do you think, group? Um, what are the, the signs, the red flags? It's such a good question. I mean, to me, you know, if you've been struggling for years and teetering on the edge of whether or not you can, you know, afford staff, 
Um, to me, if you are not in a pattern of growing, you're in a pattern of shrinking. So if your budget doesn't get bigger every year, it gets smaller every year. Um, if you're not growing your programs and services and able to keep, keep up with demand in terms of growing your budget and your income and your revenue streams, I mean, I think those are some serious red flags. If you're constantly, um, if you don't have any cushion, financial cushion, if you don't have two or six or a year's worth of money in the bank, um, if your donor list isn't growing, I think it probably is a sign that it's time to consider mer merging or ac uh, you know, being acquired by another organization. It's a tough decision to make. Okay. All right, so JB says, do you have any success stories in the performing arts where there is no real expectation of programming anytime soon? Um, I don't know if I have any, I mean, I've heard plenty of donations going to arts organizations where there's no real expectation. Um, I wonder if any arts organizations, performing arts organizations on the line um, want to share their stories. Howard says arts programming should be moving online, you know, um, and uh, let's see. Oh, there's a long, a long one. Um, Dana says we just participated in Giving Tuesday and raised 10,000 in 24 hours. I don't know if you're an arts organization. I'm guessing so if you're responding to that. Um, providing online access. That's what lots of people are saying. You know, it's, it's definitely challenging. Um, um, and, and Emily says talking about streaming programming, you know, I think it, it's a major issue because, you know, artists, performing artists feed off the audience and when it's not live, it is going to be a challenge, but I think you're going to really need to think outside of the box and figure out what you're going to do. But, you know, people who love performing arts and theater are not going away and they can't wait for you to come back. So they're going to continue to support you, even if it's going to be months or years until they can come safely. Um, but to me, that's not something that they're willing to give up and you should continue to fundraise for it. I think I said on this call a couple of weeks ago, I heard um, Stephen King's on, uh, on NPR and he was talking about, you know, if anybody thinks that the arts are not important right now, he, he dared us to go through quarantine without music or movies or television or books. You know, he was basically saying arts are critical. You couldn't survive quarantine without it. So I hope that helps. All right. Uh, Brian, I'm new grants manager at a nonprofit that doesn't have a strong grants program. How do I build relationships at this time? I mean, listen, um, I think that you know foundations to some degree are supporting organizations uh, that they've been supporting. Um, I think you're going to have a bigger, bigger uphill climb than if you were an existing organization. But you know, it's it's same as always. Send emails, pick up the phone, reach out, ask thoughtful questions, do your research in advance. Don't waste their time. Um, so, anyways, all right. So. Let's see. Um, oh, Jonah uh, says, please tell us how to find your article about bringing joy to your board. Um, so it's on my website. It's the, it's the most recent blog post. So it's just at amyeisenstein.com. I'll put it in the chat box. Uh, did I spell my name right? Hopefully. Um, and it's on the homepage. Scroll down to the top blog post. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks, Rick. Rick's uh, sharing it with you. So I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got time for probably one or two more questions. This is so great. Listen, you guys, I want to thank you so much for joining me every week. This hour on Thursday afternoons is the highlight of my week. With you being here, sharing information, being so supportive of one another and of me, and sharing your success stories and your challenges. Um, I'm not going to lie. This is a stressful, stressful time. Um, I don't, I don't want to make little or light of the challenging circumstances under which you're working right now. 
Um, but I, I do want to say that people are raising more money than ever, many of them. And, but, but it's hard. It's hard work. It's not an easy thing. And so those of you that are doing well, you know, you deserve kudos, huge kudos. Um, those of you that are struggling, we hope that we're helping you and supporting you and pointing you in the right direction. Um, I am, thank you so much for all of you in the chat that are, that are chatting in such sweet things right now. Um, I do wanna remind you that through the Capital Campaign Toolkit, starting next week, we are offering um, a cohort, actually it grew to two co cohorts because we had enough interest in an eight week, $100,000 mini campaign. So if you're interested in a real crash course, live on the ground experiential um, fundraising experience for eight weeks with me, um, we still have a few slots left because we did open up to two cohorts, but here are the rules. You have to have at least a list of 10 people that you are confident that you could ask for $5,000 or more. So this isn't magic, but what we're providing is structure and accountability and a plan. So basically it's an eight week um, intensive cohort where we're gonna be putting together a campaign for you to raise $100,000 or more in the next eight weeks. So if you want to participate um, or you want to find out more, it does cost money, um, but the return on investment is going to be huge. So if you want to participate, send me an email and I'll send you the details. Um, okay. So let's see. Last question of the day. Um, any tips on feeling less isolated and more motivated? I'm currently the only member of our leadership team working from home and the only member of the development department. It's hard to be isolated from coworkers and clients. I love the idea of spreading joy. Okay, listen, um, I think that, you know, in general, um, in general, I'm just typing in my email address here, Joe, for you, um, in general, Development is an isolating profession. I mean, I would say that 80 or 90% of us work in one person shops. Only a few development people work in universities or hospitals or big international organizations where they're in big groups of, or, uh, with, with lots of fundraisers. But for the most part, um, most of you are working in smaller shops with one, two, maybe three, if you're really lucky, fundraising professionals. So in general, development is an isolating field. So first of all, number one, that's why we're doing this here, having these town halls so that you don't feel as alone. You're in a community here. But two, um, join the Association of Fundraising Professionals if you haven't already. I mean, that is where I've made friends and colleagues for life going to those meetings. Now, of course, those meetings are remote, but um, they're still having lots of programming and it's a wonderful way to meet people, to connect with other fundraisers, to ask your questions um, and things like that. So anyways, all right, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end on that note, I think, um, before my voice gets hoarse. I will tell you where the information is um, for that eight week mini campaign. So it's at Capital Campaign Toolkit, I'm typing, dot com slash mini hyphen campaign. And if I spelled it right, it is now in the chat box. And you can go to that link and find out. We actually give you the calendar of the mini campaign, um, the eight weeks. So you could do it yourself. You don't even have to join with me. Um, the reason to do it with me and the cohort is to have accountability and structure and um, and training and whatever. But um, I'm giving you the calendar of eight weeks. So I challenge you to rate, go out and raise 100,000 or more in the next weeks, um, eight weeks. I think, you know, if you have a donor base, relationships with some of those donors, have mid-level um, and a few major donors, then you can raise you can raise that kind of money. So listen, thanks everybody. Uh, I'll see you next week. Let me know if there's a, a guest I should have on, um, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye everybody.